I went through years in my childhood thinking my name was actually Fenian Bastard because I get called it that much. I'm naturally quite defiant, so I embraced that identity. That's that I go to see Celtic. It gave me my formative uh, political education because if you go to Celtic matches back then, you'd always have activists who signed with pamphlets because the, the, the troubles were in full sway. And in the split second during which I was trying to decide which set to follow, I was off the road in the car, so I broke my neck. One of the rooms had a dining table and I'd set myself up there during the day. Um, whatever I was reading, if I came across a word I didn't understand, I look it up in the I stop reading, I look it up in the dictionary, and I write it down in a journal. George has lit things up as only he can. So people have to understand that there's certain times in our politics where the issue takes over your own personal grievances. It has to. In this moment, everything's about Gaza. Our society is not underpinned by democracy at home and human rights abroad. It's class oppression at home and militarism abroad. John, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. Yeah, great to actually see you in person. It's been a long time. That's right. That's right. It was in the, the G8 march that we first uh, crossed paths. 2005. Uh, is that when it was? 2005, yeah. Fucking hell. Well, it was chaos. We found, and who was the guy next to you in that footage? they will probably not like me for mentioning his name, Nick Early, is now BBC that, that's Chief, Nick Early, that's BBC right, yeah. Chief, of, Chief Political Board Correspondent, yeah. That's right. What, that's a, what a genesis he's been on. <laughs> he was a wee Marxist revolutionary. <laughs> I remember going to Krem, I remember going to meetings with him and he was really militant. Um, the system can't be reformed, the only revolution is the only solution. What, what do you say, you know? Totally, totally. Um, you grew up in Stenhouse, that right? Salton Mains, right. New Stenhouse. Yeah. Right, yeah, all right. right, okay. What school did you go to? Uh, St Joseph's Primary, right. and then St August, St so, August's uh, yeah, second. Right. Ah, okay. Um, Mad days. There was, St August was, was a Catholic school, wasn't it? There was, yeah, yeah. There was yeah. St Thomas, I went to holidays, there was, so St. Thomas. St. Thomas is had three Catholic schools, yeah. That's right, aye. Yeah. Um, it was right next door to Forrester High School, so we used to meet a lot of you. Bullied a lot, you know, for the broomies. Uh, if you were caught with your uniform on. <laughs> I mean, I grew that, up, I, when I grew up in Stockton, Mainz, um, at the age of five, I got sent off to the, the Catholic primary, you know, most of my pals, 95% of them got sent to the local state schools. Then was, and that's when the trouble started. You know, like suddenly you're different. So I went through years in my childhood thinking my name was actually Fenian Bastard because I get called it that much. So um, I'm naturally quite defiant, so I embraced that identity. So I got into Irish, I started going to see Celtic. When I was 14, 12, 13, I started going to see Celtic and got into all that and Irish Republicans. And I used to hang an Irish tricolour at my bedroom window and I used to write IRA on my fucking trailers. And, so I really embraced it, but it gave me my formative um, political education. Because if you go to Celtic matches back then, you'd always have activists who signed with pamphlets because the, the, the troubles were in full sway. And they'd have activists try to raise money and they'd, they'd have pamphlets talking about certain issues. And then the hunger strikes, you know, that was a seminal moment in my childhood. I think I was, I went, 13, 14, when that was happening. So I don't, I don't know if you're older to remember, but, the troubles in the North Island were the backdrop to, my, to 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 our lives for many years. You know, there's been another bomb, been another another soldier killed, been another RUC man killed. You know, and just yeah, it's a, it's you never thought that would ever end. You know, because it was just so permanent. Totally. It was there when I was born, and it was there right up until 1998. Totally. You know. Totally. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because um, I've often. I've often been quite dismissive as to how much sectarianism was in the East Coast of it's in Edinburgh because no, it's here as well. Think of it as predominantly a Ouija no, or a no, West no, Coast no, issue, no, you know. No, at least, no. at least, I, 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 and I've provocatively in the past, I've even written articles where I've almost said this is a West Coast problem. It's not as bad. It's not certainly not as bad. <clears throat> um, it wasn't as bad or prevalent, but it was definitely here. I mean, Hearts took on the mantle of Rangers in Edinburgh and Hibs Celtic. I mean, Hibs was an avowedly Irish Catholic club when it was formed, um, but that it really went out of its way to sublimate its Irish identity in order to try and assimilate. Um, it had the harp badge um, as its crest, and it got rid of that. 
Um, but Celtic did, and Celtic kept their Irish uh, roots and made that part of their, their sport and identity and their institutional institutional identity. I mean, Dundee United used to be called Dundee Hut. That was an Irish Catholic oh. club when it was formed. So, you know, where the pockets of Irish immigration were in, on the, in, the, in the docks and Leith docks and uh, in Edinburgh, it was the Duke Mills and down at the Grass Market and the, the Cowgate that was known as Little Island in the That's 19th century, right. where James Connolly, of course, was born oh. and grew up. Um, so no, it was definitely there, definitely, it was definitely there. Um, and it split the working class, you know, it split working class communities. I mean, I remember when I first started applying for jobs at the age of 16, my dad would say, um, if this, on every application, what school were you, did you go to? He says, don't say Catholic schools. And I thought, okay, so I just, but I never even thought, I never thought, well, that's wrong. It was just how it was, and the culture was, was really kind of degenerate and debased in that sense. Was this, was your old man a Celtic supporter? Was no, that the no, so what, what, more hibs. Why, what, what, what drove you to Celtic? Like, was that because of the, the, the sort of... That, my big brother was a Celtic supporter in the late... See, he started taking me to see Celtic matches when they were played in Edinburgh in the late 70s. And then my big brother switched to Meadowback Thistle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would go so, see them sometimes. So he was fighting a lot. Um, so, but I, no, it was, a lot of it was that. Was, was a, I, needed, I needed to find a sanctuary, actually. And it was like, wow, I'm on the bus with these guys. And they're all, you know, I used to get the Leaf bus outside the old Ryries at High, High Market. They'll be smoking, drinking, singing Irish rebel songs. And I thought it was great. Because you're, you're part of something. Everybody wants to be part of something bigger. And that was my something at that point in my life, in the early teens. And I'd go to other matches and then the old forum games in the old jungle were just, I was at this 1980 cup final when they had the, the fighting on the pitch. The notorious cup final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember, I was only 13 and I ran on the pitch and I thought they, they were running on, you know, to celebrate. Actually, McPherson referred to it as like Vietnam. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, fun, the funny thing was they brought over this American, um, you know, girls band, right? Sergeant Major Band, I can't remember the yeah, term. Yeah, yeah, Majorettes. Majorettes, like, sorry, yeah, Majorettes, yeah. To, for the halftime entertainment. <laughs> and they're all fucking sitting in the stand saying, what the fuck is this? It's been bottles and that guy bastard and chasing each other. <laughs> then the police came on with the horses, it was chaos. Mm -hmm. um, but there was there's something, being, you know, more serious and analysing that, there's something very attractive about hatred, actually. It's a very potent force. And that's why, you know, I think it's why it's been hard to, to, to get into politics for socialism to break through sometimes because if you look at, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm going on a tour de horizon now. If you look at Brexit, you know, nationalism and national particularism is a very strong motive force. It's hard to break through that, I've found, in the spirit of internationalism and class consciousness because it's easier to identify a human enemy than it is to identify this kind of Abstract, o opaque, you know? yeah. it's the banks, it's yeah. the corporations. That doesn't work for a lot of people. They need to see an enemy that they can look, you're the cause of my fucking problems. Um, so through that experience of supporting Celtic, you know, orange mm -hmm. bastard, Fenian bastard, it's really potent. And that's why I think it's still entrenched in Scottish culture. Um, because it's a way people who are alienated, you know, um, whose lives are drudgery and, you know, during the week they have jobs they hate, they have to do them. It's a way that they can feel bigger than themselves and, you know, vent their anger uh, over their condition and over their, you know, how their lives are, have turned out. Totally, yeah, totally. You, you, you see, you mentioned class consciousness there, which is kind of something that, it, 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 for me, has become a kind of um, <clears throat> a pivotal uh, concept within our, within our contemporary political mm -hmm. uh, framework because the erasure of class consciousness from from the, the yep. from the language from the culture has been a very deliberate act by the you know the, those that control the, the, the yep. strings of power. Yeah. Um, when do you, when do you think you were aware of of what might be considered a, a class consciousness or otherwise? Well, retrospectively, and it's obvious clearly it's retrospectively. When I was nine or ten, my dad was a crook. He was a rogue. You know, he was you know he was in prison and all that. Um, he was always cheating something, always trying, you know, that was just him, that's his character. Um, and when I was nine or ten, well in those days in the 70s, everything was rented. The TV, the furniture, you had to put money in the meter to get your, to get your gas central heating on and all that. And he would routinely not pay. No, he'd not pay the rent on the, these items because he wanted to spend the money in the pub and chasing women. 
uh, or they break into the meter and they steal the money. So we would have a succession of debt collectors coming to the door. And I was given the job of answering the door, because I was only a wee laddie, and saying, and I was drummed into me by my mum like the catechisms drummed into a Catholic, you know, make sure you stay, your dad isn't here, don't say he's not in. And the reason for that semantic difference was crucial, because they were also claiming to the council that they were separated, so they were getting cheap rent. I think my mum was paying five pounds a week rent or something in the 1970s for a two bedroom council house in Stockton, Maine, which are now, I just found out, are going for 850 pounds a month. And that's a rundown housing scheme. So I always, so that inculcated within me an understanding that in, in life there is an us and there's an them. And, and from that I planted the seed uh, of a distrust of authority, which I always carried, I carried forward. But it manifested in me my rebelliousness uh, in crime. I was involved in criminal activity uh, when I was younger. Um, some of it fairly seriously, fairly, fairly serious. Um, but I remember reading, when I started getting into reading books and educating myself, um, something from Ralph Ellison, the great black American author, and from his classic novel, Invisible Man, he said, crime is an act of unconscious rebellion. And I think he's absolutely right, you know? People who are not satisfied, they're not going to accept the status quo. You know, they're going to rebel against the system. It's not something you would promote, obviously, because most of the victims of crimes and housing schemes are other working working class people. But that's the motive. It's, it's people saying, "I am," and your pride gets involved, and I'm no, and I'm going to march to the beat of my own drum. And you get a sense here, I don't know, maybe transcendence, false as it may be, uh, negative as it may be. But that was the start of it. Uh, and then when I was 25 in 1992, um, I was in Mexico doing something I shouldn't have been doing. I'm sure you can imagine what. <laughs> and I was uh, late at night. I'd been working all day with this guy who I was working for. And I was following him back over the border, back to Los Angeles where I was living. And he was driving too fast for the condition. And I was tired, I was knackered. Right? And it was a really windy road in the middle of nowhere, pitch black, deserted. Um, but about 20 minutes from the border. And I was that tired, my eyes were watering. And I've come round the corner and I've so momentarily saw two sets of taillights, seeing double vision. And in the split second during which I was trying to decide which set to follow, I was off the road in the car, so I broke my neck. He drove me, anyway, I'm lucky to be alive, obviously. Um, so I came home, and in that year of convalescing, um, I just thought, something's really important has happened to you. I mean, you kind of just go back to where you were. And I started to reflect. Um, I had loads of time on my hands. I was in a halo and all that stuff. Uh, I thought about the people that had been in the, the, the treatment I'd received from these nurses over in America. I was in a hospital in America for six weeks. The care, I mean, I was an asshole then. I judged people how much they could bench press in those days. Um, and I just thought, well, you're a fucking waster compared to these people. Because um, I was really bad. I know I always died a couple of times in, 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 in theatre as well. And I thought, well, you can't waste your life. You know, you can't just go back and just be back to being an arsehole who just read bodyboard magazines and so on and wanted to get involved in adventures and whatever. Um, so I started reflecting, I started reading serious stuff because I used to be quite good at English when I was at school, even though I left school at 15. And I wrote for the school newspaper, I had an idea I wanted to be a journalist. But then I got distracted and left school and just went just went astray. So I started reading again, um, um, philosophy, history, it was very discursive. And these were those were the days before Google. So I would have a, I would read in my then partner's girlfriend's, she had a, she had a, a flat in West Maitland Street, one of the rooms had a dining table and I'd set myself up there during the day. Um, and whatever I was reading, if I came across a word I didn't understand, I'd look it up in a, I'd stop reading, I'd look it up in a dictionary and I'd write it down in a journal, you know, the dictionary definition. And then if I come across it again, I didn't, I, I, you know, it took you about three times before you absorbed it. So do you all that then? Uh, aye, exactly, exactly. And, and I did that for years and years. And I still do it. Fortunately now, I understand most of the words, but then I was really starting from scratch. Um, but it was almost, you know, that platonic theory of coming out of the cave, out into the light? Of course. Yeah. I, felt, I felt I was kind of doing that. Well, looking back, I feel like I was doing that. I was really, it was starting to change. Uh, it didn't manifest in a class consciousness right away, but then I started to get drawn. So if I was reading somebody, like I was reading Henry, Henry Miller, he would reference Marx in one of his books. I thought, oh, who's Marx? So I'd go and read and seek Marx. And that really caught me because I love polemics. I love writing that's on fire. I like people that take a position 
and they argue it strongly. Mm. Uh, that that you know when the words come off off the page, and I was attracted to that, and then I started thinking about you know I read the manifesto, couldn't handle capital, no for a, quite a long time after. But most of the classic uh, anti during I read some Trotsky, started reading about the history of the Russian Revolution. One book I did read that was seminal was Howard Zinn's uh, People's History of the United States. That really, that really, you know, resonated and really inspired me and made me think about the world because I had this fixation with America at that point. Um, you know, the land of the free. You know, I grew up on American movies and I've got to go there. And I sort of started to see America in a different way and about the history of U.S. imperialism. So that was the journey, but it was theoretical and, it, as I say, it was discursive. And then the poll tax campaign was in sway in Scotland in the late nineties, led by Sheridan. I remember going to listen to him speak. Um, it's funny. It's funny how it's contradictory. Uh, I, I, I went to see hear him speak uh, at a hotel in Haymarket. He was camp. He was trying to get the recruit. I think Colin Colin Fox was there, and he just lit me up. And the thing that lit me up more about, it, I found him really relatable. He's a guy from a housing scheme like me. Up to that point. And I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but the political activists I'd come across in the street and all that, all mid, seemed to be middle class and had all the badges on, and that just repelled me. I thought, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Totally. Uh, he was different, suit on, and Absolutely. you know. He was, uh, I mean, he was amazing. He was oh, awesome. listen, you've got to give him his, you know, Absolutely he's got loads of detractors, but you've got to give him, he really did a lot to, to educate and inspire a whole, a new generation of uh, working class radicals, and he travelled the country, and uh, I, I give him credit. I mean, I'm not in touch with him anymore. Just, but uh, yeah, you've got to give the guy credit. Definitely, I, I feel I feel that way about him. I think it's interesting when we, were, you know, we can come back to it. But you know, the criticisms that Galloway is currently receiving. You know, what I mean, the, uh, there's a lot to be, you know, for, for, for whatever the the fallibility of the man or whatever the, the things are worthy of, of critiquing. Um, there. There's something about somebody that can hold a room, can captivate an audience, no. that can that can that can speak publicly in that manner. It's a, it's a particular skill. It's a particular thing to to see when when it's done well. And Sheridan had that in spades, like you know. Oh, for sure, he was a force. He was an absolute. And he still, I think he still does to a certain extent. I don't think he, I don't think he's he, he, he's incapable of of no. bringing that. But he's he's taken some yeah. substantial knocks, and perhaps that's. Yeah, I mean, everybody, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, it is what it is. I mean, you know, I think it's difficult when you're in a position of you're either being receiving huge adulation or huge criticism. I yeah. think it's hard to handle that, uh, like Tommy had and like uh, George obviously has. And I've been around both of them quite a lot. Um, and, you know, they're celebrities, you know, they're, they're mainstream figures. You're walking on the street, somebody's coming towards you, you don't know if they're going to give you a handshake or a punch. Totally. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to handle. Um, Sorry, go back to what you were saying, though, like, if you remember where you were at. Yeah, so, 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 so I got, started getting involved. So I joined the SSP, uh, but only as a lay member. I remember going to one of the national conferences. It was actually being held at the city chambers. And I didn't know a soul. I went myself. And I just sat and listened. And then they had a series of fringe meetings, and I had a big interest in the Irish issue. So they had one in Ireland, and I went. And I didn't, even, I didn't have the confidence to make a contribution, but I didn't like what I was hearing. Uh, it was like, you know, two tribalism and all the rest of it, which is not my rendering of that, that struggle and that issue at all. Um, and then I remember bumping into Colin Fox at another event in George Street in the assembly rooms and I approached him, he was behind a, a stall. And then I said, I told him, I said, I'm not impressed. And he says, well, it's a fudge, we have to, because we're in Scotland. So that was my, my contact with Colin. And then I went to uh, LA in 2000. Um, and as I say, I was a committed, by this point, I was a communist by inclination, I was a Marxist uh, in terms of my world view. Um, but obviously I was in America and I was writing screenplays and things, I got a manager and I was going to meetings and I had a project in development. And I was I, got, I was working as an extra in movies, and like Friends and ER and some big movies. And then I got my SAG card and then I started um, Dublin for actors and so on, like Ben Affleck was one, Brendan Fraser was another one. But then 9-11 happened, and I was in LA in 2001, and it happened, and I've never, I'll never forget how it, it was surreal. For the first few days, the whole country was not back on its heels. There was a sense of, wow, what's just happened, obviously. Uh, and, then I, and I knew, I thought, there's going to be some, the, the wrath of fucking Kane is going to come down on whoever's responsible for this. 
So in America, they've got a series of progressive radio stations called the Pacifica Radio Network that was set up by uh, anti-Vietnam war activists in the 60s. And the one in it that covered LA in Southern California is called KPFK. So I was listening to that in my car. And this day I'm coming back from some shitty TV show somewhere in, in the valley I was working on. And they were given a list of come, upcoming events. And they mentioned that there was going to be a meeting at the, at the LA office of the Answer Coalition, which was, uh, that's the acronym there is An Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. Um, that coming Saturday, and the topic was going to be US imperialism in the Middle East. And I was like, that's, I loved that. You know, I was fascinated by that subject. So I said to myself, you know, John, you've got to get involved. You can't just sit back. Something really big's going to happen here, you know? So uh, with trepidation, I phoned the number, and I'll never forget, I spoke to this guy, Scott from New York, nice guy, uh, became really good friends with him. And he was very well. I'd been to a couple of meetings in, to different socialist groups, but I didn't feel I was welcomed. I think they thought I was an undercover agent, actually, you know? Um, but this, this, I walked into this meeting, I was a bit late and it was underway. A guy called Richard Becker from San Francisco, great mind, uh, he was giving this talk on that subject. The room was full and I sort of shuffled, you know, shy, shyly into a chair at the back. And I thought, right, if you're going to come here, you're going to have to make a contribution. I think I was fighting against that, that lack of confidence that we are conditioned to have as working class. We know education, I thought, I'm going to make a contribution. And I put my hand up, nervous um, and I said I think I said are there any um, communist what, what's the state of the communist party in Iraq um, and he gave me his answer and at the end of the meeting uh, obviously I knew as soon as I opened my mouth I would stand out because of my accent and I remember this old guy this old French Algerian guy called Rudy he had the t-shirt on me <laughs> Che Guevara and he goes you Scottish and I went, oh, fuck, what's coming now? <laughs> this is true. And I went, yeah, he goes, oh, George Galloway. So I guess you're not that In a positive sense. Aye, aye, aye. aye. <laughs> went, oh, I think George had just been expelled. I had no contact with George at this point. And this is obviously pre, pre the Senate then, is it? This is pre, but that's, that, because that's... Uh, aye, aye. Before that. That's before right, that aye. That, well, yeah. that was 2006, wasn't it? Yeah. So, and then... So yeah, so so I, I joined them. I got I got I got right involved. I loved it. Um, it really was. I found it really stimulating and, and, and meaningful. Organising, you know, buses to go up to big marches in San Francisco, going around to the black community. So I was very active, and it got to the point where the sort of movie side of things and trying to be in Hollywood, I just I hated it. And I wrote a book about this. It's called Dreams That Die. I brought back the rights. I'm rewriting it. Uh, Misadventures in Hollywood. It was published in 2013 by Zero Books. And I talk about how um, the politics took over from the aspirations to get into the film industry. Even though I had a manager and I had a producer neck and I was still writing stuff, I found more and more of my time was being taken up by being active or writing stuff, writing political pamphlets and so on and, and things like that. And then I came back for personal reasons to the UK in two, it started in 2005. And then I rejoined the SSP and then, but then I became an active member. And then obviously, you know, I joined, I got involved with Stop the War, um, and I got involved in Palestine solidarity work. Um, um, I mean, I was hyperactive. I was like three, four meetings a week, activity at the weekends. It, it, yeah, it, it took over my consumer totally, life. Totally, yeah, no, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a real service you've put in, like, or factivism, like, you know. Well, uh, uh, yeah, well, people have done more, but yeah, I mean, I got a lot. I got a lot from it. It wasn't just you know. I didn't see. It, I thought I've got you know. I think when you develop a level of consciousness, you can't not. No, I can relate to that. And that's the yeah, stage I, I was at. Whatever it is that you do, you find a way to incorporate to uh, an extent or another. That you, your your convictions become part of that, don't they? It's and, and and I found it. And the big thing for me was it was intellectually stimulating. I loved you know <clears throat> debating these ideas and historical events and. And obviously, I'm, at this time, I'm writing pretty fairly seriously, and um, so it, it it just was a wonderful kind of alignment of um, things or factors that that I needed at that time, because I, you know, the guy, any of my friends who knew me when I was eighteen or nineteen to see how I turned out, publishing book, writing books, they would never have believed it. No, no, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I was working the doors in Edinburgh. I was getting to fight, you know, I was just a thug um, back in the day. Then we got to ref referendum. Twenty fourteen. Aye, and you were part. Were you part part of Galloway's anti? Aye, I, 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 um, 
I mean, when I was in SSP, SSP were pro-independence, but I was always maybe too nuanced. I felt it was, it's got to be on the grounds of Connolly. Uh, Which is a fantastic, st exactly. I mean, that's, it's got, that's it's the got, thing that's missing from it. Really. Uh, that's uh, what's it's got to be a republic. Know? It's got to be, you know, it's, it's not got to be under any illusions that just changing the flag is going to change everything for working people. You can't eat a flag and all that. Um, and I just felt that the, the the independent. I know some good co comrades got involved and they said it's a good first step. And my, my thinking was, but it'll be the only step because it's SNP's program that you're fighting for. It sounds to, it's, it sounds to me that you were uh, you were ahead of the, the game there in terms of who a lot of us were well, thinking. Well, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I thought. I mean, and, <laughs> I, and then I saw the white paper and I Although thought. Although I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying that I would have. I don't know how I would have to, I'd have to think about that. I, I did go to see one of those yeah. things that he did, you know what I mean? And I, and I, I found him inevitably a bit of a showman, and et cetera, et cetera, you know what I mean? But but I think that... He's got a real, listen, George has got a a, a, a real, real detestation for Scottish nationalism. Mm -hmm. Real detestation. Um, did you, you didn't share that then, obviously. You didn't share it to that extent. Not to the same extent, no. I just thought that um, there, it was a trap. I thought, you know, I, I buy, you know, as I say, the white paper I thought was terrible. Yeah, you know, it was fucking it, 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 was, it was free market, it was neoliberal, especially over the currency. It was like independence without independence. It was like, you know, especially when the SNP um, abandoned their previous red line policy about non-NATO membership. And they said that we joined NATO. And I thought, well, what you're going to be campaigning for and voting for is to become the junior partner to the junior partner to the empire. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the mantra, which is true theoretically, that a bus driver in Newcastle is more common than a bus driver in Edinburgh than it does with you know, a business owner, etc., etc. Um, and I still then believed in an entity called the British working class. I no longer do. Um, and I've got reasons for that. You know, the, the, the Brexit is major. But I really thought about I wrote an article about this. Working class unity across the different regions and constituent nations of the UK began to be eroded with deindustrialization. Yeah, you know, because it, we are culturally different up here from them, from down there. That's just a fact. Um, we have our own history, and then many. The UK is an artificial state, uh, but the linchpin that kept working class people united was the big industrial struggles, uh -huh. the miners, the printers, the car workers, etc. With that gone, <laughs> new identities were being forged along cultural lines, along national lines, uh -huh. and obviously we are, we have more of a collectivist ethos where we do up here. Um, and obviously, the, the, our experience at the hands of Thatcher and the Tories, um, never had a Tory government here since the early 50s, um, democratic deficit, uh, all these things I think are really important in terms of establishing a Scottish national identity, but be careful with the word. I mean, the, 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 the Yes campaign driven by the were clever in establishing it on the grounds of civic nationalism. And it was, it, it was inclusive. It was, I mean, even though I was opposed to it at the time, uh, it was a joyous campaign. It was, it was, it, that's it, what, that's what it was a tribute to a democratic system um, with all the, the flowing in of different ideas, different groups. It was positive. Uh, I mean, I remember I debated Jim Sillerson. That was fucking hard. Uh, down at Lock End, you know I mean, somebody had dropped out who was meant to be debating him, and I went down, and it was all pro yes. But I wasn't, I mean, I got, I got challenged, but I wasn't, I didn't feel uncomfortable. You know, it was, it was very civil. Um, um, and I, I, I remember I was with my then wife the day before the referendum vote was to take place. And we're driving down Leith Walk for some reason. And every window seemed to have an eye, an eye poster or a saltire. And I, and I turned to Ruth, who, who was, who, who's English, I said, they've won. You just felt, they've won. And I wasn't really that sad. I was now at this point starting to question my decision to be on the other side. Mm. And then they lost and I was I was booked to do an interview. I mean, I remember the world's press was down at the Hollywood. I mean, the whole world was focused right. on Scotland for that period. Right. And and I was focused to do an RT um, uh, slot to analyze the result. And I really felt sad. I was down there, and you saw people wanting about with their saltars and just like the, the, you know, the, the, their future taken away. And I really thought, oh, this is this is sad. It's a sad day. That was. And, I. Then, <laughs> and, then, and then Salmon resigned, so I gave it a Shakespearean quality, like he fell, <laughs> he, he fell on his sword. That's right. And I was like, wow. I thought that's that's sad, but I'll, I'll not always. 
I mean, you had the radical independence campaign that was taking the, the message into the housing, the schemes. It was, yeah, I, I don't think we'll get anything like it again, I hate to say. Um, and then, obviously, Brexit was horrifically divisive. It was ugly, where this, the Scottish independence referendum campaign had been joyous and positive and enthusiastic and inclusive. This was exclusive. This was really English nationalism, red in tooth and claw. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I've always said that it's the job of socialists to try and inspire the working class to reach for the stars of human emancipation, not to follow it into the gutter of nativism and bigotry and anti-migrant hatred. Um, that's when things really turned ugly for me in British society. But the, the, the but the underlying fact that nobody really people don't emphasise enough is the crisis in capitalism wrought by the financial crash in 2008 mm -hmm. leading to that global recession never recovered from that no. and neoliberalism did, then died mm -hmm. but it's not it's a corpse that's yet to be buried no, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't um, that. and I couldn't, so, I so what they do what, they, what they've done cleverly the right so I've said the centre ground collapsed on the back of that so the centre ground can only hold in periods of prosperity and abundance because there's enough of the pie to give crumbs to the working class and keep us keep us satiated, you know, as it were. Uh, that was no longer possible. So the transference from... So a, a crisis of private greed was turned into a crisis of public spending mm -hmm. and that's when they imposed austerity. Mm -hmm. um, and then the right-wing right, right -wing ideas began to predominate over left-wing ideas. Mm -hmm. um, the the alt-right became a thing in America and it transferred over here, and that played into Brexit in 2016. Um, Brexit was never Brexit was never about democracy for me. It was about identity: who is really British and who really is not, who really should be here and who really should not. Uh, it was a pushback against multiculturalism, multiracialism, and all the sort of you know all the myths surrounding the Second World War and British history and the Empire, and um, it was a a reach, you know, it was a nostalgic reach back in time to a supposed golden age when Britannia ruled the waves and the Union Jack flew wherever the fuck it wanted. That was what that was. And, and, and the debased sections of the working class in England, especially in the North and the Midlands, that's our banjo country. That's our Southern States of America. You know, they've got their hate and they've got their nationalism. And as I said to you, Perry, hate's a very strong motive force. Uh, and that's where we are now. Do you think? Do you think when you when you look at those kind of um, entrenched, which we, we we have we have elements of it here in Scotland as well. We, we, yeah, yeah. We have it. We've discussed that already. It's like, it's like uh, but do you ever do you ever see a a way where that can be penetrated and that and that can be that can be ameliorated in some way or other. Is that, is that something that you... Do you have any hope for the, <laughs> for the species? Uh, in that well? Uh, well, you know, we've got a really powerless trade union movement, um, low level of understanding and engagement on these issues. Um, major political figures bought into that. Um, George, I hate to say it, was one. Uh, people with influence. You know, the George Galloway of 2006, when I first came across him and got to know him in 2007, would have nothing to do with the George Galloway of 2016. He would have been a sworn enemy um, he'll say that things change I'll say well they didn't change that much you know he'll also say that he, he doesn't um, he, he's not a fan of those who have grand damasian conversions which he you know right. he himself has, <laughs> has gone through I'm saying <laughs> hypocrites uh, not, not something we wouldn't disassociate with the, with the, with the political class at any, at any level I, I mean he, he sees himself as a Benite um, I mean the, the, the European the anti-Europe position was, was a left wing um position to have in the civilities. But with a different economy. With a very we still had a heavy industries, we had a large internal market, um, a lot of really well paid unionised jobs. We didn't need Europe. We didn't need this trade. We didn't need to have, you know, free trade and, and, and frictionless trade. Uh, the the, the noughties, it's a right wing hobby horse. Uh -huh. The really existence forces driving Brexit were of the right, not the left. And I, you know, I, I made this point. I says that you know, left supporters of Brexit from the left are but are just mice riding on the back of a right wing tiger. You know, um, there was no such thing as Lexit. There was no real force on the left. Would... I think there's a position. I mean, I found myself kind of erring towards it at times. That again, it's down. I mean, don't, that, can that, I just clarify? So don't give me no. I hate the EU. Yeah. I hate the EU. Yeah. Uh, that that especially now. 
after what's been going on in Ukraine and so on and the position they've taken on, on but you know um, the poison of neoliberalism was injected into Europe by Thatcher wasn't it the other way around and Karl Liebknecht the great German communist once said it best the main enemy is at home you know so can for so when you've got something like Boris Johnson who an old Tony and an absolute you know doyan of you know the, the political class presenting himself as a man of the people uh -huh. something's wrong uh -huh. you know something's wrong and he was able to do that because all the focus was on Europe, uh -huh. not on these bastards. Uh, and he succeeded. Jacob, Jacob Rees Mogg. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, the, 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 it's, it's almost incomprehensible, really, when we look at what's been allowed to happen in terms of the shift. But this is as a fundamental uh, uh, product of, of uh, the, the erasure of, 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 of class. Defence within, yeah, yeah. within within yeah. within within society, you know, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with the with the removal of of of, of class resistance. This yeah, is what cla yeah, cla yeah, uh, yeah. But it's become a national category now, class in parts of the country, you know, and everything now is seen through the prism pris prism of country rather than class. Mm -hmm. And Scottish independence referendum was the same that started it, you know, um, and that's never that's not going to go away. Because in the context of the Scottish independence referendum, a national consciousness was raised. It's probably uh, dissipated somewhat because of the crisis that's enveloped the SNP. There was far too much um, worship of Sturgeon. A cult was set up around her, the Stall Defender. Um, um, you know, and, uh, and then you obviously got the, the English now. So it's almost two competing nationalisms now. When people, you know, that, that's where it's come. Yeah, and, and, and then you're getting now all into the real culture wars as another US uh, export uh, or import from the US over, uh, you know, whatever identity. So class now is being placed on a shelf alongside trans, alongside, you know, gender, alongside, yeah. you know, all these various different, uh, and you can choose whichever one you want, rather than class being the fulcrum that can bring together the most amount of people. And you know, and then established you know the strongest political force Absolutely. And a, on a counter hegemonic basis. Mm -hmm. That's gone. That's not there. There's a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It's very worrying. Uh, but it's also essentially it's 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 the scientific solution. It's, it, there, yeah, there's yeah. The, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go away. <laughs> you can't. It's going to go. That's what, that's why, that's, that, I mean, I call it the intersectional apothecary. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 I say it's just another, another, yeah. you know, drawing or intersectional. But it's also the one that's closed as well. You know, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. only has it just been relegated to some sort of you know, category. It determines it's, everything. <laughs> it determines. It ter you know, it, was it Althusser said? You know, the, the dominant ideology bombards you every single fucking day. Yeah. You know, with cultural references, advertisements, yeah. billboards. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. that's 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 the dominant ideology. Definitely. This is the best of all possible worlds. Absolutely. Don't expect this is it. This is the best of all. Which, and, you know, and, and it becomes a fundament, fundamental question of consciousness itself at that point, because it's essentially you know whether or not you've developed a class consciousness or any other form of consciousness. It's ultimately how do you defend yourself against that? Precisely. And understand it. Precisely. Um, Precisely. Uh, Precisely. And 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 you've got to try and smash over open the Overton's window. Totally. It's far too narrow now. Totally. The other day that you had you had managed to articulate a uh, a lucid short piece on uh, Aaron Bushnell who had given his life for the Boy. Palest Palestinian cause. I think. Just wanted to say a few words and share some thoughts on the horrific uh, incident that took place in Washington D.C. with the self-immolation of 25-year-old Aaron Bushnell, a U.S. airman. Uh, I could not make up my mind when I first saw it whether it was a man who had taken temporary leave of his senses or whether he was just incredibly brave, committed and had given what he was about to do much thought and consideration. He referenced words such as colonizer and ruling class, which suggest to me that this young guy had developed a socialist, Marxist, communist consciousness. And I believe that he is incredibly brave and that he's not insane or he wasn't insane, but we are, because he understands or he understood in taking this extreme action that this was a human emergency. This is a human emergency that's been unfolding in Gaza for five months, 13,000 children fucking slaughtered, thousands more injured, traumatized, women murdered, people being given amputations without anesthetic because of these Zionist white supremacist cunts. You made a really good point when you basically said, you know, it's. 
it's not him that's mentally ill, it's us, you know. And no, yeah, I really yeah. felt like that. I, I do I, feel I, that. I think, yeah. I think I thought that was yeah, that powerful. was that was that was for me. That I, I mean, yeah, I still sh struggle to 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 really get to grips with what he did. Um, just the way he did it, he was so lucid, he was so calm but purposeful. He wasn't under the influence of anything, but there was this complete surety of purpose and <clears throat> zero hesitation. Even when he was struggling to light, you know, you could have thought he had that moment thinking, what are you doing? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And he was yeah. determined to do it. And then screaming, free Palestine, free Palestine, I mean, I mean, look, throughout human history, the, the people want to die for their beliefs. You know, John Brown, you know, um, you know, um, the, the Irish hunger strikers, you know, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, as a man, not as a, not as a son of God. You know, we've had these figures who've come along and they kind of give us a joke. And I think, uh, I wrote a piece, we're too clo close to that deed of Aaron Bushnell to really appreciate what he did. Yeah. It'll be future generations yeah. that'll, that'll see. Yeah. Because, yeah, because it's easy to dismiss things like that and the swirl of events. But historians will look back at that and say that was, you know, that's... We saw some of his words, some, the people had found some of his words and, uh, and he had said, you know, people ask, what would we have done at times during the Holocaust? No, you're doing it now. And, and, he, and he says, you're doing it now. It cuts well, through more so than who, who, who was it? Some arsehole, he said, um, set yourself on fire, it's the stupidest thing to do and so on and so on. Might have been that fucking idiot Ben Shapiro. And, you know, there was a Polish Jewish guy who did the self same thing? He didn't sit but he committed suicide protesting at the atrocities being committed by the Polish Jews. So the real kind of historical parity, uh, parity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, and we've got to seize that because getting onto that issue of Gaza, you know, right now um, the people of Gaza have far more in common with the Jewish victims of Auschwitz mm -hmm. than they do with the people who pretend claim to be acting in their name mm -hmm. in their memory. Um, you know, victimhood, victims of genocide share a bond of humanity that transcends race, culture, religion, whatever else, and they belong to humanity entire, not just the one people. Um, so the historical irony, the cruel irony, is that Netanyahu and his clique are, they're Nazis, they're fascists. There's no other word for it. Uh, and they're acting like fascists because what they're doing is they're, they're, they're involved in a project of extermination of a people based on nothing more, not self-defence, that's bullshit, on on this white supremacist creed Zionism, which holds that, you know, uh, might is right, and there exists in our world a hierarchy of human worth, and that we are Western, anointed Westerners and white people, and by the way, white supremacy is not just an, uh, 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 a racial construct, it's also an ideological one, Ulster loyalism is a white supremacist creed, um, Indian nationalism and so on under Modi, but so they're acting out that ideology on a people that they've dehumanised, demonised and have reduced to the status of subhuman in their minds and in their hearts because it's the only way they could, they could justify doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a reassertion of the Palestinian humanity that is a key struggle and that's why Aaron Bushnell did what he did because he was obviously grief stricken um, that this was allowed to take place in our time. Mm -hmm. No lessons learned. You know, medieval minded people with 21st century technology. That's what's been, what's, what's been acted out in Gaza these last five months. When we look at the response, the political response, I mean, I, I actually consider it, I, I see because of the, the paucity of political class that we're, we're, we're currently uh, got now, you know, these opportunists, these professional managerial class kind of, you know, yeah. backsliders and what have you, um, it's almost like. Gaza for them is just another Brexit issue or something. It's like it's just treated as some kind of like you know political stumbling block yeah. that they've got to kind of figure out how to maintain their positions, retain their jobs, and yeah. if possible, and and not compromise themselves, but particularly. So there's no strong voices. That's why when George Galloway won the other day, that it, it seems to it seems to have sent a bit of a shockwave uh, because it, it is in in some respects, and this is. Really looking at it from those who claim to be of the left, you have large sections of the left which are essentially liberals who want to think of themselves as left wing or liberal left, you yeah, know, yeah. who will call themselves socialists. Strangely enough, but they, they, they don't they don't seem like socialists to me. No. But they are fiercely critical of of Galloway's victory. 
when in fact Galloway's victory is in fact in some respects a victory for the for the Palestinian cause in some ways, uh, irrespective mm-hmm. of how we feel about Galloway. Well, Galloway, the, Galloway yeah. hates liberals and they hate him um, because he um, I don't know he's a ghost of Labour's past. Um, he's got some social conservative views that are not incompatible with where liberalism is just now in terms of gender and the trans thing and so on. He's got very traditional views on that score. The f- believes in the institution of the family and so forth. Which he's a very religious man, or he believes in God and, and so on, and believes in foundational principles um, about community, etc. People, Some people... They would argue that he doesn't believe in anything other than George Delaware. Yeah, well, that, that's... Business. Yeah, that's... that. that uh, uh, and, and, you know, so, sometimes I've seen that and I've felt that myself. Um, but George... Despite my disagreements with them, which I've, I've had few, quite many, are no longer in touch or in good terms, but um, you cannot gain say the man's work ethic. I've been around him, 69, he's still on the campaign trail, still dealing with people, still dealing with the media, still dealing with all that pressure, still lucid, still sharp. You know, George, for me, it, when he's good, he's good, there's nobody better. But when he's bad, you know. Mm-hmm. George needs the big struggles, George shines when there's a big issue and the fray gets to a certain point, like the war in Iraq, um, like what's going on in Gaza. Um, and you cannot, you know, you cannot decry his achievements. I mean, he's been the most impactful and uh, consequential backbench MP of modern times by far. I think it's, I think it's fair comment. I think it's, an int- it's, a, it's interesting for me when I look and see uh, the, the critique that he's receiving from certain sections of the, the liberal intelligentsia and all the rest of it, because you kind of say to yourself, you know, we've watched these larcenists rob the public purse forever. We've watched them destroy the, the last vestiges of social democracy that we've ever had in every every public institution and otherwise. We've seen, um, you know, like like you know the 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 the, the, the stuff filling their boots during COVID and all the rest of it. Yeah. With all these all these kind of. Yeah. And we look at the alternative that we've got as any kind of political class, whether it's from well, the Labour, there are no alternatives. So when you have this kind of anomaly, if you like, occurring, it just seems interesting that, that they're incapable of perhaps articulating it in the way that you've done there, where it's like you're, you're, you're going to say, look, he's, there's lots of things about him you can criticise, but against them in this current situation, this is not the worst, well, the, 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 the worst the, person the, 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 the worst thing, be. The worst thing you can do in radical <laughs> politics is be out of sync with the time and with the moment. In this moment, everything's about Gaza. Because from that issue um, flows all the ills and the hypocrisies uh, of the world we live in, injustices of the world we live in. Because I maintain that you know our society is not underpinned by democracy at home and human rights abroad. It's class oppression at home and militarism abroad. Mm-hmm. Now genocide enabling abroad. Mm-hmm. And um, a foreign policy that's focused on war uh, and militarism whether directly or indirectly, rests on foundations of social and economic ju- injustice at home. And that's not just a twee phrase. The money going to the arms industry could be going to hospitals, schools, could be going to community centres, libraries, improvements in housing and stuff. So that's a political choice being made by a ruling class, which really, you know, the, the, the ruling class is that, the, you know, we have millionaires ruling us on behalf of billionaires. So when I say political class and ruling class, I mean, you know, not the, both intertwined mm-hmm. for, for, for reasons of simplicity. So the ruling class, um, they've made that choice that the lives of working people are not worth bettering uh, when it comes to how you parcel out the, the surplus created in society. Britain's supposedly one of the richest countries in the world. It's millions and millions and millions going over to Ukraine to, f- to, to fund a, a war that cannot be won. Uh, and you know, saying that you know people and benefits are, are 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 going to be squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. I mean, that's really the dichotomy. Um, so George understands that, and he's there's nobody better, even at his age, of articulating that and making those arguments. And they do genuinely fear him. Uh, and the eruption of uh, rage from the establishment at his election uh, is unprecedented, in my in my experience. And it's like this it's an establishment that really has entered its mad dog days. Mm-hmm. And it was I found it chilling that Rishi, Rishi Sunak would choose to give an impromptu speech on, on the le- lectern outside Downing Street and name George Galloway 
uh, having just won a democratic election, Lucy Sunak being unelected, okay. and talk about him as if he's an extremist, and basically declare him as an enemy of the people, and Muslims the enemy within, in the context of Gaza. Uh, so it's a very worrying time. <coughs> uh, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and, and, and I actually quite fear for George's safety. Uh, even though George is indomitable, he's resilient. I mean, that was quite something, you know. This, 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 You'll notice this beast. Nick, Gr Nick Griffin endorsed him, and obviously the Liberal left jumped on this, as, and, and, and yeah. you know, we're keen to. And, and, and there's a picture of him talking to Steve Bannon, so immediately, like, you know, I mean. There's, well, listen, these are the things that these I. Are, the these, are silly, these are essentially, essentially, these are kind of. They really don't mean much, do they? These, these. these kind uh, of no, I think they were significant at the time. I don't think they're. I still think they're they're, they're major major transgressions. That's my opinion. Uh, um, but you know, you what him talking to Bannon? Or yeah, yeah. Well, well, it looked like he was making happy with Bannon, and and you know. But the thing is, is uh, I don't know. I wasn't there, but the picture doesn't look great. But what I'll say is, you know, in the teeth of a genocide, all of these issues are parked. Yeah, I guess that's. that's if you're if you're serious about your politics. Anything else is self-indulgent, you know, and you know George has lit things up as only he can when he's when he's at his best, and the 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 the, the mountain, the tsunami of support he's had, you know, from left wing X or Twitter, I, I refuse to call it X Twitter. Um, <laughs> everybody's even including me. I don't agree with George or anything. I don't like George, but good for it. so people have to understand that there's certain times in our politics where the issue takes over your own personal grievances. It has to. And this is that time. Um, and the way he deals with the media, he doesn't take any crap. Uh, you know, and you, you, you wonder, you know, when you see George, certainly in the last few days, the way he's dealt with the media and some of his posts, he's, as I say, when he's good, he's good. Uh, on this issue, he's been really good. Is the, if, if Jeremy had George, had had George's character, would it have been a different outcome? Definitely, definitely. I mean, if, if that... Because that Jeremy's approach to being deluged with these... Uh, he, 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 he ran, he ran. He ran, he, he never faced it. He, he, you know, it was... It, that, 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 was a, that, was a tra that was a tragedy of his character that he was incapable of. The strengths that got him elected on such a huge magic, because he never really had a hinterland that included controversies like Galloway, um, uh, were weaknesses mm -hmm. when, he was in a, when he was in a gunfight. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely, yeah. That's true, um, yeah. We've had five months of this fucking horror, you know what I mean? And it's just been relentless. And we've now got a, a shift in the liberal establishment and otherwise where they're, where they're kind of, you know, they're uncomfortable with it now and they're, they're publicly becoming more vocal about it. Yeah. And you're seeing that happen with uh, members of the political class who are now, you know, they've, they're beginning to sort of, they see, and I think Galloway's kind of opened that, uh, they've seen that Galloway's won on that basis. So they're, they're keen to kind of go, oh, actually, public opinion is strong on this and yeah. this could actually be capital mm -hmm. that I could use for that. It's the same and I've seen it with artists and such like as well where they've been silent. People who have got, you know, right. profiles. Platforms. Platforms, you know, people, you know, famous people with platforms who have said fuck all for the for the for basically five months, all of a sudden they're becoming humanitarian and they're right, associating yeah. with various events and stuff to sort of to display their humanitarian credentials. It makes me feel a bit sick to be honest. I kind of find I saw your post on that on uh, Joanna Cherry, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's, to me, it's just great craving opportunism, yeah. and it's 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 disturbing. And this is and this is a kind of, a, you know, I almost feel like this is the point. This is this is the point in our living history where, if we just allow that to pass over us, if we allow these same actors to just maintain their position as either self-appointed cultural figureheads or yeah. members of the political class who just act as if we don't have any kind of memory. Then we're kind of doing ourselves a real disservice. I feel that uh, yeah. there has to be something happens uh, between those who want to either whether they perceive themselves to be left or socialists or otherwise or just a human. Well, they should never. They should, they, should, they should never. They should never be allowed to forget what happened and the stance they took or the stance they didn't take in the midst of this genocide. I mean, you know, look. They really were conspicuous by their silence, a lot of these people. And, and, now, and now all of a sudden, you know, it's like we're at 30,000 dead. And, and it's going to be more than that anyway. We know that it's more than that. And the trauma that's, the lasting trauma that's there is, is I mean, genetically going to be there for fucking centuries, for thousands of years, you know? I mean, the whole sort of hysteria whipped up over October 7th in Hamas um, is an attempt to, 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 to try and push back against the welter of support and sympathy for the Palestinians. 
Um, Hamas is a child, not the not the cause of Israel's structural oppression. You know, going on for seventy five years. Uh, October the seventh was ugly, but as I've said repeatedly, an ugly uh, oppression does not give rise to a pretty resistance. You can't keep two point two million people confined to a latter day Indian reservation, um, control their access to electricity and clean drinking water, deprive them of movement, right to move, deprive them of hope, deprive them of the future, reduce them to a state of a. a you can't do that for seventeen years and expect the resistance to consist of holding hands and singing kumbaya. You know, we would do what they were do, what they did on October seventh. Any people would do. The spirit of resistance to oppression is innate. Uh, that's not to say that I support Hamas. I certainly don't support what happened on October 7th. It's not about condoning or condemning. It's about understanding in order to try and come to a solution. Uh, and they don't want us to understand. You know, every have you seen all the interviews after it happened with that, that rancid Piers Morgan? Do you condemn October 7th? Do you condemn? It was like a star chamber. Uh, bringing on these poor sort of Muslim speakers and representatives or Arabs or people who are pro um, in Palestine, and you know, I mean, and you can see the difference in how he values human life. Again, he's one of those who've internalised these white supremacist tropes about this hierarchy of human worth I mentioned. Uh, you know, Palestinian lives don't matter as much as Israeli Jewish life. Well, that, that's that's what the 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 apartheid lobby has worked hard to achieve, and they have. They have that horrendous Elon Elon Levy, there's, there's public spokesperson. I mean, he's he's a fucking he's got a lumpy shite in his chest where his heart should be, you know. Same with Keir Starmer, you know. Um, that's, I mean, that is a that is the best we can do is is is, is leader of the opposition, you know. It's substance free man, um, got the charisma of a. You know, the manager of a local bank in Nether Wallop. He's so wooden, he doesn't put his suit on in the morning, his suit puts him on. Uh, and he's just a devious, lying, opportunistic bastard. And he's going to be the next Prime Minister. And he's been completely captured by the apartheid lobby. He's acting as an agent of a foreign power, not the leader of Her Majesty's opposition. And they get away with it. You know, they get away with it. What is it? And, and it makes us have to... What does it say about us that they can get away with this? I think there's, a, there's something to be said here about the, the erosion of suffrage, really, you know what I mean, or actually, like, ele I, I, you know, the, the electorate itself, you know, there's, a, there's such a deep inculcated apathy that's <laughs> kind of there, and people have been so disenfranchised in their sense well, of... Well, pe people are looking for personal solutions to problems that demand a collective response. Um, and but when you, for example, if that, if, that, if that was still going to emerge from what would be the left or otherwise, the left as they wish to, I mean, I don't think that, I don't know whether it's or not. It's too broad, it's too broad a term, it's become too broad a, a, a word now. Yeah. Um, you know, the liberals are depicted as left. Um, we've got licensed radicals, so I'm not going to name names, who occupy all the platforms and, you know, they, they get trotted out on, on Sky News and GB, yeah. GMB and all that stuff. And they've got their YouTube channels and they're doing perfectly well. At the status quo, and, and yeah, really, I, I often say that the the, the, the the contemporary left is a parasite of the right because it essentially it doesn't challenge the right; it just feeds off it essentially and just becomes this kind of like exactly as you say, you have yeah. this kind of controlled opposition or what have you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and and then you know when when you have these mass movements like the, that's underway just now, I remember having all these arguments when I was actively stop the war. Um, you know, you'd have the radical wing who would want to push things further and be much more take risks. Uh, to try and deepen consciousness, and then you had the moderate wing who would focus on breadth at the, at the expense of depth. And I remember saying during the, the mobilisations for the Iraq War, if you keep repeating the same thing, let's go out for a moment, people are going to see that it's not working, mm -hmm. and they're going to just stop going. Yeah. And because you're not giving them politics, that's right. You're that's giving them you're giving them activity, yeah. but you're not giving them politics. Totally. Totally. And and you know, the marches got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's going to happen again, and I'm not decrying. I know how hard it is to organise these things, and I respect every single person that's involved in organising these events. I respect the, the people that go there, bearing witness. But moral outrage, by definition, cannot last forever. Uh -huh. You know, and lo listen, moral outrage is justifiable given what's the epic nature of what's going on. But there has to be surpassed or supplanted at some point by p a political understanding uh -huh. and, and consciousness. You know. Uh, and so when you've got all these people in London, I know they make the good speeches and some, and, I've and and it's good again. It's good that all these people are still coming out, but you've got to give them a, 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 
uh, an understanding of where this can go next. You know, uh, get into the communities and so on. But you know, they might be trying to do that. It's easier said than done. As I say, I've been there. It's very stressful. It's a hard thing to do. Sometimes it feels like herding cats. I don't think that's happening. I don't, I don't think there's any real desire or, 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 or you know, ability even. Or, you know, I think they're scared. I think a lot of that, what I would even call activist classes, what I tend to call them now or whatever, I, th I think, you know, I don't think they even, I think they're... They're in their kind of little cliques and they, they feel like they're doing something, but it's actually, you know, it's kind of futile. Well, at, at this juncture, again, in the Tethia genocide, this is not normal times, um, to borrow from Connolly, you know. They should, the, 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 you know, the conventional activity doesn't cut, it's not cutting it. Mm -hmm. I know it might make you feel good, and that's important. You go, you've done something, you've gone out that day and done what you can. You know, imagine, you know uh, I said, imagine 10,000 people decided to try and take over Parliament. Mm -hmm. You've got to try and create a. You've got to try and put yourself in the gears of the machine and stop it operating, because they can absorb these marches. Look, had what, a million over a million on the streets of London on February fifteenth, two thousand three. The worst all went ahead.